my brother sister in Christ, a blessed day to you. It's glad we can gather virtually to honor our Lord God. Let us be reminded our Lord God is the creator of the universe. Through him all things were made. He who made the sun and the stars in the sky is the one who gives us life. And by his grace, for all who are led by the spirits of God are called children of God, heirs of God, and called heirs with Christ. Come, let us set apart this time to honor our God, our Abba Father. Let us begin by reading the scripture sentence is taken from the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 5 to 7. He predestined us for adoptions to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasures and will to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemptions through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Let us read Call to Worship responsively. Praise the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. The Lord is gracious and merciful. The work of His hands are faithful and just. God's covenant is established forever. His righteousness endures forever. Let us worship our Maker, our Rock and our Redeemer. May God's name be blessed both now and forever. Amen. Let us pray. Abba Father, thank you for redeeming us from our sins and adopting us as your children. We are not worthy. It is by your grace, through the blood of Jesus Christ, we are redeemed. Abba Father, we humbly come before you, bringing our sacrifice of praise. May it be acceptable to you. Let it be a frequent pleasing unto you. We worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Great is the Lord in whom we have the victory. He aids us against the enemy. We bow down on our knees. And Lord, we want to lift your name on high. And Lord, we want to thank you for the works you've done in our life. And Lord, we trust in your unfailing love. For you alone are God eternal, true down earth and heaven above. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise in the city of our God, the holy the joy of the whole world. 
Is the Lord in whom we have the victory? He aids us against the enemy. We bow down on our knees, and Lord, we want to lift Your name on high. Lord, we want to thank you for the works you've done in our life. And Lord, we trust in your unfailing love. For you alone are God eternal, thrown out of and heaven above. And Lord, we want to lift Your name on high. And Lord, we want to thank You for the works You've done in our life. And Lord, we trust in Your unfailing love. For You alone are God eternal, true down earth and heaven above. For you alone are God eternal, true down of and heaven
God is our refuge and strength, an ever present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the hearts of the sea, though its waters roll and foam, and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river. Whose stream make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her; she will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar; kingdoms fall. He leaves his wall; the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. He says, "Be still, and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress." Our Lord God is our refuge, our hope, even the situation seems hopeless. Our Lord God redeems the lost and the lonely, the rebel and the fearful, the confused and the doubtful, the sinner and the sufferer, the poor and the forsaken, the rejecter and the one rejected. There is no thought so distorted, no emotion so powerful, no circumstance so horrible, no action so twisted, and no desire so desperate as to be outside of the reach of our Redeemer and His grace. God's grace is big enough to contain every experience. That this broken world could throw at us, God says, "Be still, and know that I am God." You're the God of the city. You're the King of this people. You're the Lord of this nation. You are. You're the light in this darkness. You're the hope to the hopeless. You're the peace to the restless. You are. For there is no one like our God. There is no. 
you guide. Greater things are yet to come, greater things still to be done in this day. Greater things are yet to come, greater things still to be done here. Lord of creation, the creator of all things, you're the king above all kings, you are, you're the strength to the weakness, you're the love to the broken, you're the joy in the sadness, you are, for there is no one like our God. No one like you, God. For oh, there is no one like our God. There is no one like you, God. Great the thing has yet to come. Great the thing due to be done in this city. With glory shine. From hearts alive, we praise for you and love for you in this day. Great the things that yet to come, great the things still to be done in this day. Great the things that yet to come, and great the things that still to be done here. No one like our God. There is no one like you, God. Great the thing have yet to come. Great the thing has still to be done in this day. We glory shines from hearts alive. We praise for you and love for you in this day. Greater things have yet to come, and greater things are still to be done here. Are still to be done here. Indeed, God is the God of this city. He is also the God of this world. And so it is to this God that we bring our prayers before at this time. And the first thing we want to pray for is for those suffering from mental and emotional distress due to the global pandemic all around the world. Let's pray for them to find the support that they need and that the gospel will bring hope to their situation. Let's pray. Father, we want to bring to you everyone who is struggling and in distress mentally and emotionally all around the world. Father, we know that in this past year, uh, due to the pandemic and the effects of lockdowns and other uh, methods to contain it, many people have not only lost uh, their jobs and, and other things, but their, their whole lives have been affected. And so, Father, for those who have been despairing and those who have been without hope, Lord, we just ask that you protect and you preserve life. We ask, Lord, that you will bring alongside these people who struggle, friends, supporters, listeners, people who can help, Lord. Father, we pray that your church would be a beacon of hope during this time. And we ask that those who are in need of 
uh, listening ear or or maybe even just company even if they don't say anything lord that they would make their plight known and that they would reach out to someone father we pray that you would be the god who comforts all those who struggle mentally and emotionally lord would you hear our prayers secondly we want to pray for our political situation in malaysia let's pray that the recent developments would not add uh, further stress to our country's ability to navigate the season of pandemic. Let's pray. Lord, we commit to you Malaysia and we bring its political situation before you. Father, in the complications and the various things that are happening and developing due to political instability, due to the state of emergency due to different parties and personalities uh, wanting to maneuver their political positions around. Lord, we just surrender and submit these things before you. We pray, Father, that in the midst of all this jostling, that the government's ability to manage the affairs of this nation would not be impacted and hindered. We pray, Lord, that you will still hold our government together to do what is best for our nation, especially at this time. We ask, Lord, that you guard against things that may trigger uh, a snap election or things that will worsen the pandemic. Lord, we just pray that you will provide uh, a good solution at this time. We commit Malaysia to your hands. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thirdly, we want to pray for Patang Trinity, for our church as we navigate this pandemic as a church. Let's pray for God's leading and how we meet needs and move towards His leading. Let's pray. Father, just as uh, many countries and even our own country are uh, wrestling with how to navigate this pandemic. Lord, we too as a church, uh, our, our usual ways have been disrupted for over a year. And so, Lord, we just pray that in this season, as you continue to call us to be disciples, Lord, help us to follow your leading. Help us, Lord, especially in the area of uh, being salt and light, uh, uh, the, the area where you call us to help others in need. Lord, would you show us, would you show us where you're working? Will you show us where those who are in need uh, are residing? And help us, Lord, to respond. We pray, Father, for faith and for strength and for courage, and that you will bring us together as a church to meet these needs. Lord, we ask for your leading and your guidance. For all those, Lord, who are involved in these efforts to fulfill and meet needs, especially our Social Concerns Committee and the various other agencies, Lord, that are helping. Lord, we pray that you will give the necessary resources in the form of money, in the form of manpower, in the form of ideas, in the form of uh, administration, in the form of organization, everything that is needed, Lord, to help those who are in need. We pray that you provide. Lord, will you hear our prayers? And lastly, we pray for ourselves that we would be a people with integrity who recognize the grace of God at work in our lives. Let's pray. Lord, we bring ourselves before you. We ask, Lord, that you help us to be true to who we are inside. Help us, Lord, to guard against the temptation to deceive, whether it's by word or even by portraying uh, how, who, who we are to others. Help us, Lord, to be people of integrity. We also pray, Lord, that you will help us to be especially uh, cognizant and aware of who you are in our lives, that we will be aware of your grace at work. Lord, help us to see your goodness and grace in our lives. Help us, Lord, to see also how we have never earned 
the favours that you shower upon us, your goodness, your blessings. And still, Lord, you continue to show your grace and mercies to us day by day. Thank you. We pray all this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together as a family. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Good morning, Church. We are glad you have chosen to worship with us this morning. Thank you also for honouring our time together online. A very special welcome goes out to those of us who are here for the first or the second time. We would certainly want to get to know you better. May we urge you to fill out the Guest Connect form via the on-screen QR code right now. You may also choose to follow us on social media via our YouTube, Facebook or Instagram accounts. For the Holy Communion offering last month, a total of 11,720 ringgit was received. We want to thank you for your generosity and this will go towards the work of the MCRD as well as the SSMC for their work in India. As we prepare to give of our offerings and pledges, may we now take some time to reflect upon the Lord's goodness in this past week. option is on the left. Do scan on the Touch and Go e-wallet option for e-offering. If you are contributing towards the Holy Communion offering or for pledges, you may use the bank account number that is shown on the right. This month, in support of the Drag Methodist Women Social Concerns work, health screening vouchers will be made available for sale contributions will go towards their work in various social concerns projects. For details or to get hold of your health screening vouchers, do reach out to Mrs. Angela Kong, who is the president of our local chapter. The social concerns team continues to work with its partners in response to the poor and needy especially those who have been affected by the extended MCO. Do support them by helping the team identify a need, validate the need, and send us the details. You may reach out to any member of the Social Concerns team or simply send the details to the church office via the phone number or the email on the screen. We're still observing Small Group Ministry Month Last week, you heard from some of our young adults who have been part of a small group. This week, let us hear from young families. Let's roll the video. Um, for me, my main objective for joining an SG is mainly to be able to learn more about people's life experience with God and also have fellowship together. As for me, uh, is to able to understand God in the comforts of close brothers and sisters. Well, we've been moving around in previous years and wherever we went, we've always looked on as your church to go to. So, we feel that it's important that we want to connect with fellow believers and 
to be able to feel belong in God's family. So also knowing friends here in uh, Penang Trinity uh, really helped us to settle down uh, quickly. My motivation to join uh, SG has always been rooted on God's commandment found in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 to 25. That says, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. SG has helped us to uh, able to regularly keep track of each other, uh, even though we are unable to meet regularly. And I think uh, one of the most important thing is that uh, we are still able to share each other concern and uh, pray for one another. I must say uh, I found it hard, very hard in the beginning. I was so used to the face to face and switching to online, uh, it was difficult for me to have the same desire um, but we kept on going and kept going and through our weekly meetups our learnings and especially our sharings and upholding of one another that, that really uh, kept us going and help us stay rooted in God's word and also kept us sane throughout the year opportunities for sharing our challenges during this pandemic and upholding each other in prayers help to sustain my family's mental and emotional well-being. I personally think that uh, being able to attend a small group is really a form of uh, God work as uh, He enabled us to meet and also uh, worship together regularly. Mm. Well, for me, I can really see how God's uh, work through uh, our CG member, their life encounter with God, and how they have touched our hearts during Bible studies. I think God has connected us and the young families, and it has given us a safe and a trusted platform for us to really share openly our our concerns. I was down with COVID-19 early this year and also experienced a loss of my beloved mother recently. I want to thank my SG members for the support provided during this challenging time. I will miss the catch up with our small group members. You know, like how is it going with everyone's life and also the prayer that we have for each other. For me, I will definitely miss the the sharing and, and the praying for one another. And I think our children will definitely miss the, the company of the rest of the children. Um, I thank God that our SG can still meet virtually during this pandemic time. I can't imagine a Christian life without a fellowship and prayer support. Everyone become uh, tech savvy. <laughs> they, they know how to use the right gadgets and find a real, uh, right channel so that we can still meet digitally through online results. During this pandemic time, though we have zero to minimum physical meeting, but we do notice a better attendance and improvement in punctuality during the virtual meeting. learn to worship together with our small group members and uh, also you know how they observe their parents and look at our time for God. We have also um, a session, a Bible lesson for the children uh, whereby the parents will take turns to, to teach them um, followed by some arts and crafts for them to, to do as well. So, and they were also involved in praise and worship, you know. However, we wish we can come up with some useful activities for our children during our SG virtual meeting. 
Our children used to have a separate program prior to pandemic and now mostly remembered during prayer session. Me personally don't think it's uh, necessary to uh, connect to only young families, right? Uh, we enjoy um, diverse age group as part of our SG. It is very comforting to know that uh, with fellow, fellow young families together that uh, we are not alone and um, as we face whatever struggles that we have uh, together. Our SG members are like a part of our big families in the community. I like the quote that says, it takes a village to raise a child. There are 17 small groups uh, meeting today in various locations. For those who are yet to join the SG, we welcome you to scan the QR code displayed. Scan the QR code and let's get connected. We hope you will come and join us at our small groups. We are looking forward to see you soon in SG. So friends, join a small group and be blessed. If you are not in one already, we really love to connect with you. Come and be blessed. Come and be blessed. Today's scripture reading is taken from the book of Genesis chapter 26, verse 34 to chapter 28, verse 9. When Isaac was old and his eye was so weak that he could no longer see, he called for Esau, his older son, and said to him, My son, here I am, he answered. Isaac said, I am now an old man and don't know the day of my death. Now then, get your equipment, your quiver and bowl and go out to the open country to hunt some wild game for me. Prepare me the kind of tasty food I like and bring it to me to eat, so that I may give you my blessing before I die. Now, Rebekah was listening as Isaac spoke to his son Esau. When Esau left for the open country to hunt game and bring it back, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, Look, I overheard your father say to your brother Esau, Bring me some game and prepare me some tasty food to eat, so that I may give you my blessing in the presence of the Lord before I die. Now, my son, listen carefully and do what I tell you. Go out to the flock and bring me two choice young goats, so I can prepare some tasty food for your father, just the way he likes it. Then take it to your father to eat, so that he may give you his blessing before he dies. Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, but my brother Esau is a hairy man while I have smooth skin. What if my father touches me? I would appear to be tricking him and would bring down a curse on myself rather than a blessing. His mother said to him, My son, let the curse fall on me. Just do what I say. Go and get them for me. So he went and got them and brought them to his mother. And she prepared some tasty food just the way his father liked it. Then Rebekah took the best clothes of Esau, her older son, which she had in the house, and put them on her younger son, Jacob. She also covered his hands and the smooth part of his neck with the goat skins. Then she handed to her son, Jacob, the tasty food and the bread she had made. He went to his father and said, My father, 
Yes, my son, he answered. Who is it? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Please sit up and eat some of my game, so that you may give me your blessing. Isaac asked his son, How did you find it so quickly, my son? The Lord, your God, gave me success, he replied. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Come near so I can touch you, my son, to know whether you really are my son Esau or not. Jacob went close to his father Isaac, who touched him and said, The voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He did not recognize him, for his hands were hairy like those of his brother Esau. So he proceeded to bless him. Are you really my son, Esau? he asked. I am, he replied. Then he said, My son, bring me some of your game to eat, so that I may give you my blessing. Jacob brought it to him and he ate, and he brought some wine and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, Come here, my son, and kiss me. So he went to him and kissed him. When Isaac caught the smell of his clothes, he blessed him and said, Ah, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. May God give you heaven's dew and earth's richness and abundance of grain and new wine. May nations serve you and peoples bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers and may the son of your mother bow down to you. May those who curse you be cursed and those who bless you be blessed. After Isaac finished blessing him and Jacob had scarcely left his father's presence, his brother Esau came in from hunting. He too prepared some tasty food and brought it to his father. Then he said to him, My father, please sit up and eat some of my game, so that you may give me your blessing. His father Isaac asked him, Who are you? I am your son, he answered, your firstborn, Esau. Isaac trembled violently and said, Who was it then? That hunted game and brought it to me. I ate it just before you came and I blessed him and indeed he will be blessed. When Esau heard his father's word, he burst out with a loud and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, me too, my father. But he said, Your brother came deceitfully and took your blessing. Esau said, Isn't he rightly named Jacob? This is the second time he has taken advantage of me. He took my birthright and now he's taken my blessing. Then he asked, Haven't you reserved any blessing for me? Isaac answered Esau, I have made him lord over you and have made all his relatives his servants, and I have sustained him with grain and new wine. So what can I possibly do for you, my son? Esau said to his father, Do you have only one blessing? My father, bless me too. My father, then Esau wept aloud. His father Isaac answered him, Your dwelling will be away from the earth richness away from the dew of heaven above. You will live by the sword, and you will serve your brother. But when you grow restless, you will throw his yoke from off your neck. Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. He said to himself, The days of mourning for my father are near, then I will kill my brother Jacob. Would you join me in prayer? Let's pray. Lord, we pray this morning that you would help us to put our attention before you, that even as you speak, we would listen. We pray that you remove distractions. We pray that you widen our minds and that you open our hearts. Help us, Lord, to be sensitive to the truth that you have for us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, in an age of social media profiles, you usually can find a page that has a short description about that person, right? And usually that this profile would be written by that person themselves to describe who they are. And so if Jacob had a, a social media profile page, at this point of his life story, his, his profile page might say things like younger twin, uh, homebody, that's somebody who enjoys staying at home, by the way. Uh, culinarian, right? But in some 
social media profile platforms, uh, social media platforms, sometimes people can also leave comments on your profile. And so, if Jacob had a social media platform where someone could leave a, leave a comment, maybe Esau, his twin brother, would leave a comment calling him heel grabber. Right. Now, the birth of Esau and Jacob, they are both twin boys, and this is recorded in Genesis chapter 20, 25, verse 24 to 26. And uh, the, the birth is recorded there. Esau was named Esau because he was a very hairy baby. And Esau means hairy. Okay, And Jacob was named Jacob because he was holding on to his twin brother's heel as he was being born. And Jacob means heel grabber. And so this makes me wonder, you know, if there are any people who are named noisy because they are noisy criers when they are born. But anyway, uh, a heel grabber is a Hebrew idiom for somebody who deceives others. Okay, so it's not exactly the best name uh, to give a child. It's like calling, naming somebody uh, liar, liar, pants on fire. <laughs> okay. Uh, thankfully, Jacob does not have this name forever because he's later renamed as Israel in Genesis chapter 32. And the, the nation that was promised to Abram would be named after him, Israel. And that's why this story is part of Israel's origins, not just the nation, but also the person. And today we're looking at one of the more famous episodes in Jacob's heel-grabbing career. Because this isn't the only time that he deceives others, oh no. Deception is very much who he is at this point. It's very much part of Jacob's character. But despite all that, he's still part of the, the origins of the people of God known as Israel. And so a big idea for today is that God fulfills his perfect purposes through imperfect people. Okay? God fulfills his perfect purposes through imperfect people. Well, today's passage revolves around the story of Isaac wanting to bless Esau and Rebekah plots with Jacob to steal that blessing for himself. Now, before we continue further, it will be helpful to know what this blessing is all right, and why it's such a big deal to this family. So what's a blessing? Well, today a blessing can mean several things. It can mean wishing somebody well, all right? Blessings to you. Uh, it can be a polite thing to say, right? It can be a, a sum of money given. It can even be an automatic response to somebody sneezing, right? When somebody sneezes, you say, bless you. Uh, by the way, just in case you're curious, one of the supposed origins of this practice of saying bless you when somebody sneezes comes from another pandemic uh, during the 14th century known as the Black Death, the bubonic plague. So when people sneezed, as a, as a symptom of, of this plague, people pronounced a benediction, right? Bless you, because that person might be dead soon. And so they wanted to speak a blessing before they died. Don't know whether true or not, right? But that, that's one of the, the supposed origin stories. And, but that brings us to another meaning for the word blessing today. And that it can be a benediction. And a benediction basically means a good word. Right, that we pronounce upon others, wanting God to fulfill that goodness in their lives. And so this last meaning of blessing is probably closest to what a blessing is. A blessing is a favorable situation or condition or an experience originating from God's action. All right, so although blessings, blessings can be given by humans, uh, really only God can make these blessings come true. Okay, so the humans can pronounce the blessings, but only God is the one who can do the actual favorable outcome for that person. And so in today's passage, although Isaac is pronouncing the blessing, God is the one who actually does the blessing. Right? Mankind doesn't have the power to manipulate God to produce favorable outcomes just because of the words that we say. Uh, that's another topic, like the effects of prayer, which we're not going to look in to today, all right, but so God is the source of blessing, of producing outcomes that favor a certain individual. And so usually these uh, things that 
they would consider good. So like wealth, money, property, uh, good health, children, success, legacy, you know, and so on. But sometimes blessings are less obvious. Like the blessing of ex accepting Jesus after experiencing tragedy and pain. Or the blessings that come through raindrops like we, we sang about on Easter. But in today's passage, the blessing that Isaac gives has more meaning than wishing God's favour upon somebody. In verse 2, Isaac says that he's an old man. He doesn't know the day of his death, right? So he is expecting to die soon. He's probably about 135, 137 years old at this point. He's almost blind. Uh, he's expecting to die very soon. He, he doesn't actually die uh, for another 40 years, by the way, but he doesn't know that. He, he just feels so old, like he's going to die already. So the blessing that Isaac wants to give to Esau before he dies is an inheritance blessing. And so this is a bit like a last will and testament. Isaac, he's expecting to die soon, so he's putting his affairs in order. And this blessing is part of that. And we don't know whether actual property or, or possessions were attached to this inheritance blessing, uh, but there is some element of prophecy, okay? At least for the patriarchs like Isaac and Jacob. Because the, the blessing that they pronounced uh, would later come true, right? Either because God had revealed to them what would happen to their descendants, or because it was already consistent with his will, which we will look at later. And so, Now, just to clarify, a blessing is not the same thing as a birthright. The birthright goes to the firstborn son, and it's the, the head of the household status that carries on the father's legacy and inherits a, a double share of what is given to all the children. That, that is the birthright. And so both Esau and Jacob are twins, but Esau came out first, right, by a short period of time, maybe a few minutes, and that makes him the firstborn. So the birthright belongs to Esau. And what happens to it? Uh, Jacob buys Esau's birthright off him for a bowl of stew, right? This is the story that's recorded in Genesis chapter 25, verse 29 to 34. And uh, Esau was being foolish, he was being impulsive by selling off his birthright for something like a bowl of stew. But Jacob was also taking advantage of his hunger, right? And he was being a heel grabber even then. So coming back to this inheritance blessing, whether it signified material blessings or prophetic blessings or even both, it was very significant to the whole family, not just to the two sons wanting that blessing, but also to Isaac. Uh, because he, he really meant it when he pronounced the blessing and he you know, couldn't just take it back and say, uh, actually, I, say the, I, I said it to the wrong person, let me just say it again. You know? uh, no, it meant that much to him as he said it. And so, now that we have a better idea about this blessing, let's look at two perspectives of this whole episode. Okay? Firstly, from the human perspective. At uh, first glance, it seems like Isaac and Esau are the victims in this story. Right? After all, Rebecca and Jacob, they're trying to deceive an old blind man. But some things to consider. Firstly, when Rebecca was pregnant with Esau and Jacob, they jostled within her, and so that caused her to ask God, you know, why is this happening? And God tells her, so this is his answer to her, uh, to Rebekah in Genesis chapter 25, verse 23. The Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. So here God himself is saying, the older will serve the younger. 
Uh, would Rebecca have remained silent about this? Unlikely. She would probably have told Jacob, right? And that that was probably the reason why he wanted Esau's birthright in the first place, because he he thought it was his, right? That that the the older would serve the younger, and so he was just making that happen. It's it's likely that she would Rebecca would have also told Isaac as well, since it involves the son that she prefers, and so she would want Isaac to also favor him. But Isaac preferred Esau, and this was probably why he wanted to give Esau the inheritance blessing anyway, despite what God had told Rebekah. In fact, although this story involves Jacob and Esau, the main instigators in this story, the main ones who are pulling the, uh, moving the plot, are actually Isaac and Rebekah. They are the ones who set the events of the story in motion. And so what we have here is a case of two parents showing favoritism. Isaac wants his favorite son, Esau, to receive the inheritance blessing despite God's word to Rebekah. Rebekah wants her favorite son, Isaac, uh, sorry, Jacob, to receive it. And she masterminds a scheme to achieve that. Now, oh, was Rebecca thinking about what God had said to her about the older serving the younger when she, you know, that, that prophecy, uh, when she cooked up this plan? Uh, oh, maybe. Maybe she thought she was fulfilling God's word, but she definitely didn't go about it the right way. But, you know, surely she would have known how this story would have played out, that Esau would find out and this deception would drive the brothers apart. But maybe Rebecca was thinking about how God had also told her that two nations, uh, two people from within you, will be separated. And on top of that, there were probably some in-law conflicts as well, as uh, Esau's wives were a source of grief to both Isaac and Rebecca. And you know, maybe like like Sarah, uh, Rebecca wanted to make sure that that side of the family doesn't have anything to do with the inheritance. Uh, so, so those are the parents. In the meantime, we have Jacob. And although this deception is Rebecca's idea, and she orders Jacob to commit the deception, she basically says, listen to me, obey me, right? This scheme is consistent with Jacob's character of being a deceiver. And he goes along with it anyway. And he's not just reluctantly going along with it, even though he has some doubts initially. Uh, as, as he goes along with it, and Isaac is asking him questions, uh, suspecting probably something something is is off because his voice sounds like like Jacob's voice, but Jacob even uses God's name in his deception, right? Uh, when when Isaac asked his son in verse twenty how he managed to hunt an animal so quickly, Jacob replied, "The Lord your God gave me success." Very daring in his deceit. And so this Jacob is the one who would be the name of God's chosen nation, Israel. And this Jacob is the patriarch whom God uses to multiply Abraham's descendants. Compared to Jacob's parents and grandparents who struggled to have children, Jacob had 12 children and they would become 12 tribes. And these 12 tribes would exponentially multiply in Egypt until by the time they, they leave Egypt in the Exodus, there are about 600,000 men, not including women and children. Right? So Jacob is the one who produces that, uh, who, he is the beginnings of that huge multiplication. So let's take a step back. Let's look at this dysfunctional family these imperfect people, the parents all the way down to the children, what can they teach us? First thing they, we can learn, of course, is don't follow their example. Uh, don't model our family after theirs. Right, obviously, the consequence of this deception is that it split the family apart. Jacob fled from home. He lived in fear of his brother. And from what we know in the Bible, Jacob never saw his mother ever again. But 
Other than that, one thing that I'm reminded of as I read this story is just how human they all are. Now, some people approach the Bible as a collection of legends and myths, uh, things that aren't based in reality, and as a result, uh, nothing to do with us. But I read today's passage, and it sounds like something that you might find today in some family drama, not just on TV, but happening in some home, maybe even your own home or in a neighbor's home. Maybe not the exact same thing about hunting and using gold skins and that kind of thing, but the elements of parental favoritism, sibling rivalry, family members trying to swindle each other out of each other's inheritance, right? Those things happen around us all the time. And so not only does that make the truth of the, God, uh, of the Bible relatable, it also brings us hope. Because while all this family drama is going on, God's perfect purposes continues on. And this brings us to our next perspective on this story, God's. Now, earlier I mentioned that God can't be manipulated into blessing those He does not intend to bless. And so in today's passage, God's hand is not forced by Isaac to bless Jacob just because Isaac was deceived. God knew what was going on the whole time, right? God was not deceived. But we need to keep in mind the larger picture of God's covenant promises made to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. God had already intended to bless Abraham's descendants. And on top of that, the prophecy made to Rebekah in Genesis chapter 25 verse 23 seems to suggest that it's true Jacob, specifically Jacob of the two brothers, between Jacob and Esau specifically, is true Jacob in this current generation that God will bring blessing. And so that's already been pronounced and uh, uh, made known from God. Now the last part of Isaac's blessing in verse 29 of, of Genesis chapter 27 says, May those who curse you be cursed, and those who bless you be blessed. And this is almost identical to the promise that God made to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. So although Isaac is tricked into blessing Jacob, it matches up with what God was already planning to do in the first place. So, question to ponder, would God have still blessed Jacob if he didn't pull off this deception? if he didn't uh, follow through on what his mother told him to do, would God have still blessed him? Well, definitely, because God was already going to bless him. It was already something that he told Abraham was going to do. It's something he already told Rebecca was going to do. Uh, but God chose to allow his blessing to come about through this deceitful scheme of Rebecca and Jacob. What does this mean? It means that God didn't only use this dysfunctional family with a huge grabber of a patriarch in his plan to have a chosen people known as Israel. He also used, it, uh, he also used this underhanded method of deceit and trickery to accomplish his perfect purposes. And this is best summed up in the words of Jacob's own son to his brothers in Genesis chapter 50 verse 20. But Joseph tells his brothers, You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. I need to be clear here, it, uh, I'm not saying that the ends justify the means that we should resort to dishonest methods just because God can bring good out of it. But I am saying that we can have hope that God can advance His kingdom despite man's mistakes and selfish agenda. And that is the result of His amazing grace. Now, we live in times currently that don't seem to be much cause for hope. We're living with a pandemic that doesn't seem to have a very clear end in sight. Initially, people place their hopes in lockdowns and SOPs to, you know, overcome the pandemic. Uh, I remember how proud some people were about, you know, 
Oh, Malaysia was able to contain the, the spread of the virus right, in the middle of last year. And then it got out of control. And, and so people turned their hope to vaccines. And then new, more infectious and deadlier variants emerged. And last I read, certain vaccines seem to be less effective against certain variants. Others are placing their hopes in travel and trust bubbles or herd immunity. But again, we just don't know what will happen. We don't know when this pandemic will end or morph into an endemic. And not just that, our government is also in the midst of political turmoil. And just as how many people place their hopes in some parties and coalitions or even a democratic process, we know what happened to those hopes last year. And so between the pandemic and our government, Many people's livelihoods and, and hope for our nation's future are balanced between these two things. And so recently, hope seems to be fleeting. And that might be the reason why suicide and attempted suicide rates have skyrocketed in our country in the past few months. But that is not the final say. That is not the end of the story. Today's passage shows us once again that in the midst of man's sinful and selfish agenda, also against the backdrop of famine and other tragedies in other parts of the Bible, God's kingdom continues to advance and his perfect purposes continue to be fulfilled. You see, no misfortune, no scheme of man can derail God and his good plans. Does that mean that we can expect the pandemic to just turn around quickly or for our government to suddenly be perfectly united and transformed overnight? Perhaps not. Maybe. I don't know. But it does mean that we can continue to hope in God's good purposes that are greater than those things. That God's good purposes will surely come to pass. So what are some of these good purposes that persist despite the bad circumstances that we may be in, or despite the failings of man. Well, the pandemic or any governmental situation does not undo the command to love one another or to be members of the body of Christ. So although it might change the methods or the environments that we are used to whenever we come together as a church, we can rest assured that God still makes it possible for us to love one another in community and to continue functioning as a body of Christ in this new normal. And so that is one good purpose that continues. The gospel will also continue to advance. The call to make disciples is not undone by our circumstances. The Holy Spirit will continue to harvest the seeds of the gospel that are planted in the lives of those who don't know Christ. And people will continue to be saved despite the pandemic and how it's disrupted our churches. In fact, more people might even be saved because of the pandemic and how it has disrupted their lives. And the call to do good as evidence of our faith also remains another of God's good purposes. And out of all the things that make us disciples of Jesus Christ, this is one area that is given the most opportunity to be exercised in our present circumstances. Doing good, helping those who need. And one more thing I want to highlight about God's perfect purposes being fulfilled through an imperfect people. Jacob didn't remain a heel grabber. God eventually redeems his character. Not without difficulty, as we will see in the weeks to come, but Jacob eventually is transformed. He is renamed as Israel to symbolize the new identity that he has. It's as though his, his profile page is refreshed and the uh, newer, better comments about his character end up burying the older, bad ones until they are out of sight. And so Jacob, his character, this person of Jacob brings us hope. Not only that God can bring about his good purposes despite our flaws and failings, but also hope that God can transform us 
and redeem the character flaws that we might feel are hopeless to try overcoming because we've just been struggling with them for so long. So even if we come from a dysfunctional family or maybe it's our own character flaws that run deep, there is always hope of God's redeeming work through faith in Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. And so in conclusion, could God have used someone better than Jacob in his plans? Definitely, but he didn't. And so God's grace abounds all the more in spite of the sin that has so trapped us. And so when you know that God's perfect purposes can be fulfilled through imperfect people, would you be God's faithful disciple despite bad circumstances and the feeling of man? And do hope in God and His good purposes alone. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Some questions for us to ponder on. First, why do you think God chooses to act through flawed individuals like Jacob? Second question, have you ever witnessed God's good purposes fulfilled despite human failings? And if so, what was it? And last question, what is one practical thing that you can do to live out your hope in God's good purposes in this season of tribulation? And so as we ponder upon these things, I invite us to respond in song as we sing about God's amazing grace in our lives. Call me in 
Receive the Lord's benediction and blessing. May the Father's favor, the Son's grace, and the Spirit's empowering go with you and your interactions with others in every moment before you. And the blessing of God the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you now and forevermore. Amen. The threefold Amen together. We thank you for joining us in today's worship service. Uh, if you would like me to pray for you, just click the link on in the chat, TMCPMINT. And I just want to wish that God's hope would light up your week and shine upon you, and that you would be a light to those whom you come across over this week. God bless you and see you next week. <laughs>